Good morning and welcome to Keystone Church Online. My name is Lauren Foster. This is my beautiful wife, Lauren, and we pastor here at Keystone Church. And we just wanted to take a minute to let you know what you can expect here with Church Online, if, especially if this is your first time joining us. The heart of our church is to make every person feel welcome. And so part of what you'll see this morning is a glimpse into our home because we want you to feel like you've been welcomed home into our church family. And if you're encouraged or you're a part of our church family already, and you'd like to give towards supporting the vision as we advance the gospel in our community and beyond, on our website, keystonechurchpa.com, there's some different options in which you can give and support the ministry. We're so glad that you're here today and hope that this message encourages you with the hope of Jesus. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back. How you guys doing? You okay? I think you're going to want to take notes today. So if you got a phone, pull it out. I'm going to hit a little bit about the church, and I'm going to talk a little bit about politics. So if you love this church, you're probably going to get tense here in a second. So, <laughs> but, uh, but if you got a Bible, go to Daniel 5, and I'm going to teach out of that for a little bit. And just how do we live, especially over the next 30 days, because I don't know if you know it, this state is like the epicenter of politics right now. I mean, it is like in the middle of it all. And what we saw four years ago is how it was like everything Satan tried to do, he executed it perfectly. And it wounded the church because the church didn't learn how to live above things in culture. It was living below it. And churches all across this nation closed their doors, uh, since, have closed their doors since 2020. Just in the state of Arkansas alone, where I live, 20% of the churches in our state do not exist anymore. Like, they're gone. This is not just a, a pandemic we've been in. It's an epidemic of how do believers live in the days that we live in right now. Now, who in here would say, I've kind of had my belly full of all the political stuff? We just raise our hand. Me too. Like you just, uh, And it's basically because how I was raised in a family where uh, one side of my family were diehard Republicans and the other side uh, were diehard Democrats. And we all went to the same church and everybody was passionate about it and everybody thought that they were right. And so my, my grandfather, diehard Democrat, he would pick me up. He'd be on the campaign trail campaigning for Governor Edward Edwards, who was just a crook. And so he would, he would campaign, and I'd wear a little suit at like four or five years old. I have pictures of me with a microphone singing for Edwin Edwards, you know, in some little lodge with 80 people in it, you know. And then, and then my dad was part of the moral majority. He was definitely right about everything. And then we would get to Sunday dinner. Now, Sunday, we'd all go to the altar together, pray together. We loved each other. But then I learned by like nine years old, I could just tee up a question and watch them fight. And I just love, I'm like, well, what do you think about the oil in the Middle East? You know, what, what do y'all think about that? And then they would just go on, you know. They were at each other's throat. But when I've watched the, the carnage over the last few years, I want you to have a biblical perspective of where you place some things in your heart and in your soul. So, first of all, David said in Psalm 146.3, Do not put your trust in princes who are mortal men, they cannot save you. I want us to say that last phrase together. They cannot save you. Jeremiah 17.5 says, Anybody who turns away from trusting me, this is what God is saying, anybody who turns away from trusting me to put their trust in a human being will be cursed. They're like, they're going to live under a curse. They're going to live under a lot of manipulation in their life. He's like, when you're not trusting me and you found a man to put your hopes in, you put someone else to put your hopes in, he's like, you're going to live under a curse. You've got to live above it. And I think this starts as a spiritual problem. When, when we are more and more disconnected from Jesus Christ, we will, like the person who we are, we are knowing less and less, we'll begin to put our trust in someone else who makes an impression on us. Isn't that true? Four years from now, where's Jesus going to be? On the throne. Amen? He's still going to be on the throne. He's still going to be in charge. And I, what, what I've seen probably, this, I've been in ministry 30 years now. 
But in the last 15 years, I've seen uh, this culture make idols of two types of people. And I want you to write this down. We're making idols out of pastors, and we're making idols out of politicians. We're making idols of those two people. And, and what we're, we're doing is we're saying, this is where I get my hope from. This is where this, these are the people that are going to have all the solutions that I need. They're going to provide for me. Uh, they're going to be protectors. And we've put them in a savior role. And the word of God, first of all, says that God's people says this. I don't put a human being in that role. I only put Christ in that role. Somebody say amen. There's only one perfect leader, and his name is Jesus. And Revelation describes him as faithful and true. And when he comes back riding on a white horse, they said the one who's going to come back for us is still faithful and true. He's always going to be faithful and he's always going to be true. Amen? So no matter how you grew up or no matter how you're, uh, where you're at, let me tell you a few stories, this, uh, a few principles about why politics is wearing us out. Number one, campaigning never stops anymore. It's like all the time. It used to be that we just got a breather. It's like, okay, uh, the election is up. Now the uh, election's over. They start, they start campaigning the next day. The second thing is it, uh, politics has become more vicious than it's ever been before. If you are young, you won't know this. But when I was a kid, two, two different politicians, they would square off and debate and they still had respect for each other. What now everybody just goes for the jugular. I remember Ronald Reagan debating Walter Mondale, and they both had two different policy stances, and, and then they would laugh at each other, carry on. At the end of the day, there was respect. Politics today, it's like you're in a fight every day, and it's like, man, this is wearing me out. Now more money is spent on this than it's ever been spent before. It's just like it's everywhere. I'm now getting texts on my phone from political leaders. They're texting me on the phone. I watched one thing about the Antichrist, weird little thing on my reel. I'm in an algorithm I can't get out of. You know, I'm just like, every time I look on there, I was like, I'm, am I the weird guy? I don't know. I'm just like, but it's like inundated everywhere with all this stuff. And so w when you spend more money and it's every day and then, and then the election, like the campaigning never ends, then what happens is we exaggerate the importance of politics in our life. Listen to me, Jesus is not betting the farm on this election. He's betting the farm on you. He sat on a hillside one day and he goes, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. If this world is going to change, you've got to be salt and you've got to be light. It's not going to come from one individual. It's going to come from my kids. Amen. And so what do you need to do over the next 30 days? Be the salt of the earth. Now, write this in your notes. That doesn't mean be salty every day, all right? There's a difference between being salty and being the salt of the earth. It just means that where I'm at, I'm going to fight for holiness. Where I'm at, I'm going to fight for the things of God. I'm going to stand for truth. Where I'm at, you go, well, Marcus, what do you do? This is how I do when it's election season. It's time to vote. I take my Bible. I get off in a corner. I look at policies. And I, and I got my study Bible out. And I go, what does God say about this? I am not swayed by emotions. I'm not swayed by words. I let the word of God speak right here. Amen? So let me tell you this uh, first, and then we'll get into it. For every politician that gets on your nerves, there are hundreds that are living right, and they are serving you. So don't just say, I'm just tired of all of this. There are, I know and have many political friends, and they wake up serving this country every single day. Amen? For every pastor that falls into sin, whether it's sexual or financial or some addiction, let me just say for everyone, there are thousands that are doing it right. Thousands that are getting these things right. So when you go to Daniel chapter 5, when you get there, I want to read about God weighing in on one thing, and then it's just going to be personal about how do I live my life over the next 30, 45 days. Daniel chapter 5. There was one king that God weighed in on, and this is what he was saying is, you need to know that I'm sovereignly in control of, of kings and uh, empires. So you get to Daniel, 
and you see different empires that are in control, and they come and go. There's the Babylonian Empire all of a sudden, and one night it falls. And you're at the Persian Empire, and you see kings come and go. The only thing that really lasts, and this is a great place to just, I want you to stop and think about your life. The only thing that lasts in the book of Daniel is Daniel's own relationship with God. That's the empire. That was the thing that was strong no matter who was in office and how they were leading the country. Daniel was a man of God, and he kept it. And the people that you see that God uses had a relationship with God in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 5 says, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they, they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this, uh, this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the land. Let me tell you this first. It wasn't that they didn't understand the writing. They just didn't understand what it meant. Like there was a hand, and you got to think of this. This is a whole kingdom. All the kings, all the people together, they're throwing a party that gets out of hand, and a hand descends from heaven a single hand, and begins to write on the wall. Who would get a little bit nervous at this point? All right? You know what I'm talking about? Like, they're getting nervous going, what is this? And what is he writing? And he's writing on the wall in Aramaic, and they can speak Aramaic. But they don't understand what those words mean to their life. How many of you know that there are only some things about God that can be revealed by the Holy Spirit? Like, I have just had biblical discussions with people, and they'll look at the Bible and they'll go, I don't see it. Sometimes the Bible says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Sometimes there's some things in your life where, like, the Lord has to open your eyes. So they were like, we see the writing, we know the words, what does it mean, and what, what are we supposed to do with what we're hearing right now? So this one guy gets up, his name's Daniel, and they're like, we know about this guy named Daniel. He can interpret dreams. He can interpret hard phrases. He can solve riddles. The Spirit of God is on him, and Daniel comes to the scene. Let's keep, let's keep reading, and then we'll get into some principles. He says, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praise the God of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is what he's saying. Like, you haven't been living for God. Now, God's got, he's written something because time's up for you. And he says, this is what the inscription that was, this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel parson. It's like, here's the inscription. And then he's going to tell him, definitively what this means. Verse 26, this is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Now I want you to personalize it and write it down, down like this for yourself. Over the next 30 days, I want you to write, know this principle from this scripture. My days are numbered. We're going to put it on the screen like this. Our days are numbered. Let's all say it together. One, two, three. Our days are numbered. Anything that you think you have an abundance of, you will mismanage. Anything. Like in my house, we, we love um, Arnold Palmer tea. 
We got our lemonade in there. We got, the, we got it mixed. And there's, there's this one brand. I don't know if you have it here in Pittsburgh, but it's Milo's. Milo's is the best brand. You got sweet tea with some sweet lemonade. Mix it up. We have to buy it two gallons at a time in my house. And when we buy it, we get home. My kids drink the first gallon in about 20 minutes. And then they'll start going through the second gallon. But when they get halfway through the second gallon, that's where daddy steps in. Amen. I step in. I draw a line right there with a black marker. And I said, the last half of this is for daddy. Nobody else can touch it. And I drink it in drops that big. That's it. Just a little taste when it goes down. It takes me two weeks to drink that half gallon of Arnold Palmer. (laughs) Here's a principle in your life. Everything you think you have a lot of, you're going to end up squandering it. So this is the first thing God wants you to get. My days are numbered. I don't have abundance of it. The Bible says that my days, they're like a mist. They're like a smoke. They're here today and gone tomorrow. Hebrews 9 says, man is destined once to die, to die once, and after that, face judgment. Can we read this together? Do y'all see this? Let's read it together. Hebrews 9, 27. Man is destined to die once. Come on, class. Let's start over. Man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Like we've never seen this verse on a refrigerator. You know what I'm talking about? Like never, nobody ever like, that's so inspirational. Let's frame it and put it in the bathroom somewhere. Like this one is the one that nobody wants to think about a long time. Like they read the verse and it's like, woo let's keep going. And God goes, this is the one you need to, to sit in. Like I'm gonna, I have one life to live. How am I going to live that life? When you go, my days are numbered, here's a good way to think about your life. If I had 30 days to live, what would I do with my life right now? If a doctor walked in and said, you got 30 days, what adjustments would you make? What would you go do? Yeah, I'd go skydiving and Rocky Mountain climbing and go... 2.7 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. I don't know what you do, right? But when you've got just a little bit of time, you go, what needs to change? What do I need to add? What needs to stop? What am I giving my life to that's not going to matter beyond this life, right? The only r- way to have a life that matters is to give your life to something that's going to outlast your life. He says, I, I want to give my life to something more important. So, uh, Uh, David said it like this, Psalm 39. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, just like Hebrews said, how fleeting my life is. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Like my life is, it's here and it's gone. Like, I'm, a, I'm turning 50 in a few weeks. I cannot, I can believe I'm turning 50. I got aches and pains everywhere. But I can't believe how fast I've got to 50. And then I talk to people who are 60. They're just like, I look in the mirror and I go, what, what happened? When, when you start getting older and you realize that the days I have left are less than the days I live, you really know they're numbered. But God wants this in your mindset, no matter how old you are or young you are, is that, I have one life to live. How am I going to spend it? This is something that had to change in me because I grew up in Louisiana. In Louisiana, people are crazy. I mean, the, the phrase that we, listen, our, our phrase for the state is, Les le bon ton roule, let the good times roll. You learn it when you are a kid. Everybody eats everything fried, deep fried, with butter on it. We have the lowest lifespan of any state in America. When people die, they don't have to embalm them because they're full of bourbon. You know, it's just like that is what it's like to grow up occasionally. Like, nobody cares. And then I got saved. God's like, I have a plan for your life. There's some things you need to care about in your life. So here, here's the principle that goes with this word, mene, mene. Here's the principle. Live your life with a sense of purpose. Live. Just go, God, you've got a kingdom purpose for my life. What should I be doing with my life? What do you want me to do? If you've got air in your lungs, 
there's a reason for it. It means God's not finished with you. There are some things for you to do with your life. There's some ways that God wants to use your life. He wants to use your life to make a kingdom impact. And you go, God, if you have a plan and a purpose for my life, then I've got to stop playing games and get my life right in the middle of that. Then you go to Daniel 5, 27, and he takes the second word, it's tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. It's real interesting. The Egyptians, during this time when you died, they would literally, it's kind of gross, they would cut your heart out physically and weigh it and then describe what kind of person you were by just physically weighing your heart. But when he says, you've been weighed on the scales and found wanting, this is a very descriptive way of God's just saying, your life is deficient in my eyes. Like it's like too light. You don't have enough of spiritual weight in your life. I've weighed you and I found you to be insufficient. Do you know like we're all going to stand before God one day. He's like going to weigh our lives. And I'm like, I don't want to be, I don't want that to be an embarrassing time. Like right now, when I go to the doctor, the most embarrassing thing about going to the doctor is they weigh me in the hall and I'm around everybody else. That's the most embarrassing thing. They're just like, hey, Marcus, get on the scale. I'm like, can we wait a second? Y'all need to come on by. You know, because I know people are staring at the scale. And then when I get on the scale, you know, and it feels like everybody's looking at it, I feel like I need to make an excuse. I'm like, I ate Mexican food this week. You know, you know, I've just, a lot, and last time I actually said, I think a lot of this is muscle. And my doctor, <laughs> she looked at me, she's like, it's not. And, uh, and I'm just looking at it, it just feels hopeless, right? One day, we're going to stand before God, and He's going to weigh us. But you need to be weighed on this side of eternity. If you want to be wise, weigh yourself now. When he's, when he's literally describing this, this is what he's meaning. He was saying, I've weighed you on a scale. It's like the scales of justice. And this is what he was saying. I've weighed you, and your life is out of balance. You don't have real balance with your life. And when it comes to your spiritual life, you've got a a lot of other things in your life that are outweighing who you were meant to be spiritually. And I want the spiritual side of your life to be the weightiest thing of your life. And sometimes we have ways that we describe it like, hey, I'm in a dry season. or I'm feeling empty right now. God's saying, I weighed you, though, and I found you wanting. There's more of me that you need in your life. So that's what you do. And I've been doing this in the mornings for about six weeks now. And here is the principle. Number two, weigh yourself with God. I've been doing this in the mornings. David said it like this, Psalm 140, uh, 139, 23 and 24. He says, search me, O God. This is a prayer. This is a prayer I'll pray. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Like I'll, I've been carving out some time to spend with God in the morning. And what I've been doing is I'll have like a track that I pray on. And it's, and it's, an, it's actually the Old Testament tabernacle. I have it in my mind. And so when I start praying, I'll start with thanksgiving. That's how you, you enter God's gates and you would enter the gates of the tabernacle with thanksgiving. So I'll just start and I'll just say, God, I just want to tell you everything I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for my wife, and then I, I'm thankful for my kids. I'm thankful that I got a truck to drive, and it's a Ford, and it's not a Dodge. And God, I just want to, th- and I'll just walk through anything that I can think of to be thankful for. I'll be thankful. And so when you walked, it was literally a gate. It was real light. It wasn't made of wood, and you would just go through, and that was your gate of thanksgiving. The next thing you would come up into in the in the Old Testament tabernacle is the brazen altar. And when I, when I stop being thankful for God, then I, I'm starting to be thankful for Jesus. I'm, th- I'm like, God, thank you for the sacrifice that you made for my life, for the pardon I have. You died for my sins. You laid down your life for me. And I'll just be thankful that I have forgiveness. How many are thankful for the forgiveness of God in your life? Amen. Then the next thing, and I, this, is where, this is what we'll get to in Psalm 139. There's a laver full of water in that Old Testament tabernacle. 
and you would take that water, you could wash your hands with it, but the first thing you would do is that you would look, and you know what you were able to see when you looked into the water? Is your own reflection. And when I get to this part in the prayer, this is where I pray Psalm 139. God, would you search me? I want to see the reflection of who I really am. And, and what do you really want to work on in my life right now? I don't want to be found wanting. Now, the scariest thing is of all the prayers that God doesn't answer, he answers this one every time. He's, I've never heard him just go, Marcus, you're acing it, you're killing it, just go have a great day, you know? Because a couple of weeks ago, Brooke and I, my wife, we got into an argument. And we were, we were riding home, we were arguing about something, and so she was totally wrong. And so, uh, and so, so before we went to bed, uh, Brooke looked at me, she said, is there anything you want to say? And I said, yes, I'm still right. And, uh, and we went to sleep. Then the next day, I get to this part right here in the prayer. And I was like, I don't want to see my reflection, God. You know? And he started just convicting me. And I'm just sitting there going, God, was she right? And he was like, she was right. And I was like, she's always right. It's not fair, you know? And I'm, and I'm just wrestling with this because every day there's some things that God can work on in you. And you weigh yourself with God. You make these these minor adjustments. And I had to walk in, apologize. You know, I was wrong. She said, I know. Uh, did, the, did the labor get you in the tabernacle? Yes. You know, and, uh, and she like, got me again. And, uh, and then you just, you move on. This is how the, ki- the children of God are to be. God, are you found me wanting? Is there something that you want to take away from my life? Is there something that you want to add to my life? What needs to get in balance? Is there too much worldliness in my life? You're wanting to get not enough spirituality in my life? Do I have too much play and not enough work? Too much busyness and not enough rest? What is it? Do I have too much isolation and not enough relationships? Do I have too many hobbies? Am I focused on the kingdom of God? And if you will let God weigh you on the scales, he'll go, here's the exact balance I want you to live your life with. Isn't this great? Like right in the middle of a mess, a political mess, God gives us one of the greatest messages of all, and he wrote it with his hand. And I'm telling you, this is the message for us right here for the next 30 days. God, my days are numbered. All right? God, I need to weigh my life. Uh, uh, with you, I need to be in the purposes of God, and I need to be in balance spiritually in my life. Then he gives him the last word, and in a singular sense, it's Perez. But, he, but in, the, in, in verse 27, he says, mine, mine, tekel, tekel parson, but it's Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. I want you to write this principle down. This is what it meant. God has given you warning signs that you're not paying attention to. It's interesting that from this word Perez is where we get the Hebrew word prophetic from. And this is basically what he was saying. I have sent you voices to speak to you. I've sent you my word. I've sent you people. And I've sent you prophets. And I've given you warnings from the heavens above. And everything I tried to warn you with, you didn't pay attention to the warnings. You didn't pay attention to all the warning signs. And right now, it's too late. He's telling them, you should have heeded all of the warnings. I was watching this thing on uh, climbing Mount Everest. And the people that climb Mount Everest, you get to 26,000, it's like 26,200 feet. And that's where they make sure they have their their oxygen tanks on and everything. But you still have 3,000 feet to go to climb. And then you got to get back down. But at 26,002, no matter how much oxygen you put on your back, you're you're dying. You're dying for 3,000 feet up and 3,000 feet down. And so you have all of this equipment that is strapped to you. And once you hit 26,200 feet and you start going, you are hearing the warning signs every step you take. Because even with oxygen, breathing through oxygen tanks, like there is nothing up there. People get delirious. How many of you in here have climbed a mountain before? Anybody in here? Just a few of you. I climbed um, Pikes Peak. It's a 14,000 uh, feet up there. I climbed it. 
But, you know, I'm, I'm a Cajun from Louisiana. We're lowlanders. So I went from Louisiana, and then we went up we, uh, to Colorado Springs. The next day, we're climbing Pikes Peak. When I got above tree line, I got delirious. I mean, I started seeing unicorns, and I was talking to squirrels. They were talking back. It was just like, I'm losing it. And they called that a death zone. And they said, when you're in a death zone, you got to get back to where life is at. And when I, when I was watching this thing about Mount Edwards, I thought, isn't this true with a lot of us in our lives? We have things in our lives that are in a death zone right now because we've been ignoring some warning signs from the Holy Spirit. And we look at relationships, and if we were honest, we're just like, that relationship in my life, it is dying right now. That dream that I used to have from God, it's, it's dying. Or my spiritual passion that I used to have about the things of God, it's like, it's like in a death zone, and some things that are so precious to me are in a death zone. What do I need to do? Here's The, the third thing is you've got to pay close attention to what God is speaking to you right now. Because his words will bring life to you. Like his, his words are sustenance and it'll be life. That means that every time you're in a small group, go, God, God, what are you trying to say? We're not just hanging out. Like, what are you, what are you trying to say that can solve some things and bring some life right now? Every time you're in a service and your pastors around here are teaching the word, you go, God, we're not just making it through a Sunday. There's some things that need to leave a death zone or never enter a death zone. God, what are you wanting to speak and to say to me right now? And one of the things he would say is, pay attention. I, I, I've got some warning signs built in. Here they are from my life, okay? Anytime I feel a warning signs going off, my emotions are inconsistent. Just inconsistent. Just up and down. I get frustrated, you know. And the dogs don't even like to be around me, you know. We don't have cats. We're Christians. But uh, we're like, we, we're just, I'm just kidding, gosh, all right? <laughs> it's just like, the, you see that, and you're, you got to know, what, what are the real warning signs that I can know? I'm just, I'm being less productive. Uh, I'm just being, I'm just, I'm losing focus. I, I just don't have a sense that this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing for, with God. For me as a pastor, it's like I don't know what to preach on on Sunday. That's a warning sign. Just like I don't have fresh bread in my spirit for people. That's one of them for me. It's going to be something around your career, something in your relationships. There's going to be some things like when I, when I just feel like I'm not getting inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Y'all know, y'all know ever get that nudge from the Holy Spirit? I'm like, I'm missing all the nudges. What's, what's going on? These are some warning signs that m- need to make you go, you know what, I need to back up and get away with God right now. Like a bunch of these men did this weekend. You know what happened to them when they got away and went on a retreat? There was a sensitivity to the things of God. Always, when you go on a retreat like that, there's some callous things that break off, and all of a sudden you can't describe it any other way that you're just like, God is closer right now, right? So when you have the warning signs, here here is a, a scripture, it's Psalms 46.10, I live by. It's time for me to be still and know that he is God. Amen? I've got to get away, get still, and get reconnected right now. Pay attention to those warning signs. Amen? Y'all stand on your feet. I want to pray for you. Mm. How many of y'all love God's word? Amen? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for your spiritual life. I'm going to pray for God to just, just over this next month, that every day you feel like God is speaking to you, you're getting closer to him. So let's just start personally, just right there. Every head bowed and every eye closed. God, I pray for your sons and daughters in this place right now. I pray for a deeper hunger for the things of God to be in their life. I pray for a thirst for the things of God in their life. Let nothing live in them that needs to die and let nothing die in them that needs to live I pray for some things that could be secrets, addictions strongholds in our lives, let them be uprooted right now in Jesus name and I pray that you'll clothe us with your righteousness and give us power 
to walk out the things of God in our life in the name of Jesus. I pray over the next 30 days we'll be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We'll reflect Jesus everywhere we go. We'll be the preservative to our country, to our country and our culture everywhere we go in Jesus' name. You're betting the farm on your kids. I pray for more influence for the things of God in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Let us live with a sense of urgency. My days are numbered. I got to get busy doing kingdom things. Let's live with that. Let us, let us live with just some passion around the things of God. Let's get our lives. How many of you would say, I need to get my life into some spiritual order, spiritual balance right now? Raise your hand. Let me just see who all that is. Yeah, me too. I'm working on it. God help us. We don't want to just be judged from it. We want to learn from it. Walk in it. In spiritual power and spiritual strength in the name of Jesus. Some of you are here and you know. You've been some of you are ignoring warning signs in your health, warning signs in your relationships. God just He wants you to get clean right now. It's almost like a wake up. Like, okay, no more warning signs. It's time to make some adjustments right here today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.